Good morning and welcome to the final installment of a three-part message entitled, The Six Chairs of Spiritual Maturity. For the past two weeks, I've been introducing our church to God's perfect view of the stages of human spiritual development. It's not the same as emotional development. It's not the same as psychological or even physical development. Spiritual development and maturing is an encompassing of all of those things. It's the whole body, soul, mind, spirit together. And God desires that human beings grow. And so we've been looking at what Paul says about it primarily, but what the whole Bible says about this process. Every single man, woman, and child on the planet is moving in a direction either toward God or away from God. The Apostle Paul said that his entire goal in life was to grow in a upward direction, a Godward direction, if you will. Here's what he said in Philippians chapter 3. Paul wrote, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Many have called that a Godward life. Let those of us who are mature... Think this way. So according to Paul, true progress in a person's life is marked by a Godward trajectory. And here's the key. That Godward trajectory in life eventually produces in in a person a mind like the Son of God and a heart like the Son of God and eventually behavior that matches the Son of God. That's what Paul wanted in life. That's what I want in life. I hope that's what you want in life. Spiritual development or maturity is marked by a Godward trajectory. I put a definition for you on the screen the past few weeks. I think you should probably take the opportunity to write this down. Here's the definition of how God views spiritual maturing. Here it is. It's a steady Godward movement that develops and transforms a person's inner life into the likeness of Christ. You simply can't read through the New Testament without coming away with the very clear indication that God wants to grow you. That's it. Growing means movement. That's been the big idea of these last two weeks. It's the big idea of this final installment of the message too. Maturing means movement. If you're going to progress in the different stages of spiritual development and you're going to become a mature spiritual person, it means you have to get up out of your chair and move. We've said the past few weeks, we're going to say again today, the reason that people don't move and they don't progress and they don't mature, it's the same reason. It's fear. Fear of what it will mean for their life. Fear of being put in awkward situations. Fear of being put in painful situations. Spiritual maturity means pain. But that's what God desires for all of us. He desires for us to mature and become like His Son who went to a cross. The question I have to ask you at home right now before we begin this final installment is, do you want to grow? Do you really want to mature? Do you want to become like Jesus? It's going to mean you're going to have to Get up out of that chair and do things that are going to make you feel uncomfortable. There is no other way. Let's review what we've, what we've said the last few weeks and where we're going to go today. Stage number one, chair number one, is the natural person. The occupant of this chair is spiritually dead, but they don't know it because they're spiritually blind. This is the seat into which all human beings are born. There's no one who's born spiritual. Not one person. Every man, woman, and child since Adam and Eve committed the first sin has been born with spiritual blindness, dead to God. Stage number two. That's the skeptic. The occupant of this chair, chair number two, is someone who has had an initial encounter with God by the only means that someone can have an encounter with God, his son Jesus, but they doubt the validity 
of his claims. Oh, they believe he existed. They acknowledge the plain reality that there was a man named Jesus. But they don't believe his claims. That he was God in the flesh. That he is the way, the truth, and the life. And that no one comes to the Father except through him. They don't believe it. They, they too are spiritually dead and spiritually blind. The occupant of chair number three, the most dangerous chair that a person can be seated in, we looked at last week. That's the chair of the false convert. This person bears no fruit to verify their claims to believe. We gave an example from the book of Acts of a man named Simon, who was a street magician. He confessed to believe in Jesus. He was baptized and even hung around and moved with the church, followed the teachings of Philip. But there was no fruit in keeping with repentance. Many people sit in chair number three. They think they're spiritually mature. They think they can see reality as God says it is, but they can't. This is the most dangerous chair of all. And then last week we concluded with chair number four. This is the chair of the infant The occupant of this chair has been born again. They have believed. Their eyes have been opened to the truth as God says it is. But they have yet to learn to self-feed. And the sad reality that we talked about last week is that this is the chair that many Western Christians purposefully stay in. I've called them Neverland Christians. Because like Peter Pan, they want to stay a child forever. Because they've come to believe the lie that to stay an infant means less accountability and less responsibility. Everyone else will do the work for them. And so we have an entire mass of people all around the Western world who are believers, but they're infant believers and have no desire to get up and move on to maturity. And so they stay in chair number four all the days of their life. Today we move on to the pinnacle of what God desires for all of his people. Chairs five and six. Chair number five is the growing believer. And chair number six, the mature leader. Before we examine those final two stages, we need to pray. And ask that perhaps God would even do some miraculous work in your life today. And someone within the sound of my voice would hear God speak to them and they would move into the next seat of spiritual maturity. Father in heaven, we submit ourselves to that end. We pray that you would do what only you can do. That you would cause someone to be born again. That you would open the eyes of someone's heart. That you would rescue them from their spiritual depravity and make them see. Make them see Jesus for who he truly was. As I read your word today, I pray that it would go into people's ears. That they would see the scriptures on the screen. And something would happen. I have no power. But you do. Your word does. The word has the ability to make dead things come alive. Because it's the, it's the Spirit. The same Spirit that was hovering over the waters before the world began. Before human beings were created. That Spirit that was breathed into Adam's nostrils and he became a living being. That Spirit who raised Jesus from the dead. That Spirit wrote these words. And they have the power to do the same thing to a dead person who's listening. They can... I don't understand it, but they can go through the wires, the airwaves. They can come into a person's living room or into their car. People can hear God. I'm asking, Lord, would you do that today? Would someone come alive spiritually? Would those who are immature, infant Christians, who've never really learned to self-feed and they require someone to spoon-feed them truth for the last 20 to 30 years. Those who should be teachers by now. I pray that those who would hear these words today. Even in their 70s and 80s. And would get up. And move. Become a growing believer with a new desire. 
to become mature. Those who are growing, I pray that they become mature leaders and maybe cause a revival in this country. Lord knows we need it. We need mature men and women to stand up and be uncomfortable for the sake of their own growth. And so we commit ourselves to that in the power of the Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. For the last two weeks, I've given you five things to consider as we move through each of these six chairs. Five considerations that you need to think carefully about if you're going to move. First, we need to understand what the chair is, what the stage is. So I'm giving you a label and a definition. Second, I'm giving you an an example from the scriptures of someone who was seated in that chair. Third, I'm giving you an invitation from Jesus or the apostles. Like, how did Jesus respond when he encountered someone who was in that stage of spiritual development? What did he say to them? Fourth, I'm giving you our response. So what should the church's response be when they have someone in that congregation who's in that stage of spiritual development? How should we How should we help them move? And finally, I'm giving you an exhortation. Not just from me, but I'm hoping to give you one from the Scriptures. And remember, an exhortation is a strong urging to act, to do something. Let me say right off the bat, if you won't act, if you're home just listening and thinking, that was a good sermon, really learned a lot, but you won't do anything, turn this off. Knowledge without action is is a waste of time. If you're going to go to college, spend all that money building up knowledge, but you won't do anything, it's a waste of time. So is preaching. I'm saying these things week after week with the hope that you will actually move and do something. Will you? Will you commit to God that if you hear from God today, you will act? If you will, well then let's get right to business with our last two chairs, our last two stages of spiritual maturity. Chair number five, the growing believer. That's our label. Let's get a definition. The occupant of this chair has been captivated by God and their joy is impacting others. You want to know what a growing believer is? That's it. Someone whose heart has been captivated. And that captivation has turned into joy because of what Jesus has done for them and is doing for them. And that joy is overflowing and it's impacting the lives of others. That is the New Testament's picture of someone who is growing. Martin Lloyd-Jones, the great theologian, writer, preacher, who was once a medical doctor to the royals and gave that up to teach theology because he realized that it was an elevated call, even above being a physical doctor. Martin Lloyd-Jones wrote this about spiritual maturity. He said, the ultimate test of our spirituality, our spiritual maturity, is the measure of our amazement at the grace of God. When someone is caught up by something, doesn't matter what it is. When they're caught up, captivated by something, they will naturally draw the attention of others to whatever that thing is. Doesn't matter what it is. If it's a football team and you're captivated by it, you're going to draw people's attention to it, even if they don't like football, because you have been amazed by it. When someone has truly become captivated, by the God who would send their son to a cross and pursue them into the filth that is mankind. Who would leave heaven and the riches of glory to come after them, you. When someone has been captivated by that, by that God, they will naturally draw the attention of others to him. And it will never be work. They won't have to work at this. It won't seem like a labor to do it. It will happen naturally. They'll draw a crowd to him. That is a growing believer. They may not know much at all about this book. They may only know John 3.16. But what 
they know has done a work in them. And they're growing. And they're attracting people who want to see what it is that they've been captivated by. Their joy in him is producing something. That's a growing believer. Let me give you an example from the scriptures of a person in that chair at this particular stage. The best example that I know of is Philip. Philip is a great example of a person that occupies chair number five because immediately after making the decision to follow Jesus, when he heard the invitation from Jesus to follow him, guess what Philip did? He immediately attracted somebody else because he was so overjoyed to have found the Messiah. Take a look at what the scriptures say about Philip. John 1. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip, look what he did. He went and found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Look what Philip says. Philip said to him, Come and see for yourself. Philip is the occupant of chair number five, the quintessential occupant, because when he saw reality face to face, which is what happens when you look Jesus in the face, you are literally seeing reality in the face, in the eyes of Jesus. When he came into a personal encounter with Jesus, God in the flesh, it immediately had such an impact on Philip that he went and told someone else. And that is the occupant of chair number five. Not only did Philip see God, but he loved what he saw. Listen very carefully to me. The people that are in chair number four, the infant stage, they don't move into chair number five where Philip was because, listen close, the more they see of Jesus... And they hear, there's a lot of hard teachings there. Some things that are actually quite divisive. Some, some things that divide households and churches and nations. Some things that might actually cause me to lose my friends. They don't want it. They don't impact anybody else because they willingly stay at a superficial knowledge of Jesus and God. Not Philip. Philip. The moment Philip came face to face with reality, Jesus, it immediately had such an impact on him that he fell in love with what he saw and he went and told Nathaniel. That is the occupant of chair number five. That is a growing believer. They're amazed by what they see and their, what they see overflows into joy and it affects someone else. That's a biblical example. I want to give you an example of someone that I know personally. And I'd imagine that most of you watching this know this person too. It's my wife. I think my wife jumped right from chair number one, born, spiritually dead and spiritually blind, right into chair number five. <laughs> At least this was my experience with her. Let me just briefly tell you about how Ashley, my wife, came to know Jesus and how she became this rapidly growing believer. I, I led Ashley to Jesus uh, close to 20 years ago now. Ashley was a non-believer. She believed that there was a God, but she didn't know anything about the gospel. And when I shared the gospel with Ashley over the phone, before we were even dating, she heard truth. And that truth went in to her ear through the phone. And it penetrated her heart and she was born again. She burst into tears and said, this is what I've been looking for all my life. And she immediately prayed to receive Jesus as her Savior. And that childlike prayer immediately began to work out evidence that something had changed in her heart and in her mind. Here's what I saw a few days later. Ashley worked at a deli. She was making sandwiches for people at a deli in South Jersey. And I would go and pick her up every day after she got done work. Well, one day I went to pick her up, and she didn't come outside at her normal time. 
And so I waited patiently, but a lot of time started to go by, so I decided to go in. And what I found was that Ashley was standing behind the deli counter, making sandwiches still, and talking to people about Jesus. She was telling people about what she discovered. She didn't know anything at all about the scriptures, but all she knew was what she saw. When she discovered the truth that Jesus had died for her, that she could be saved, not by anything that she'd done, but by grace alone, through faith alone, because of what Jesus did for her, she came into contact with a gospel so beautiful and a Savior so inspiring that she's never looked away. And she had to tell someone else, just like Philip, the reality that she saw in the face of Jesus, in the words of Jesus, Produced in Ashley such a joy that she stayed after work late, smelling like onions, making sandwiches, telling people about Jesus, even though she knew so little about him. And they, listen, they stayed around to listen because she was captivated by him. That's what I'm trying to tell you. Ashley's captivation, her joy that she had discovered in the person of Jesus made her a growing believer. That's someone in chair number five. It's not as much about knowledge as it is about joy. She fell in love with him, and that love impacted others. The same thing happened to Peter, too. When he was in chair number five, Peter had an encounter with Jesus that marked him as a growing believer. But what happens is many people who have this initial encounter with Jesus and there's this emotional stirring at the beginning, many of them, once that emotion dries down and they start hearing hard teachings, they all go away. Listen to what Jesus said to Peter and how Peter responded. After this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. Jesus had just finished teaching on hard truths about God. So Jesus said to the twelve, do you want to go away as well? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life and we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. In other words, Peter is saying, Jesus, you're the source of life. What else would captivate us? Your words, not only can they bring us into eternal life, But they give our lives meaning and purpose. Church, that's what my wife discovered almost 20 years ago. When she heard the words of Jesus, suddenly those words gave her dead, meaningless life. New mission and new purpose. She awoke from her slumber and she realized, I have something to live for that I didn't have before. Jesus has gave, given my life meaning. He's given me something to get out of bed for, something to fight for, something to strive for, something that will captivate me when all those inferior things run dry. That's what Peter is saying. That's what growing believers have come to realize. They've been captivated by a Savior who gives their lives meaning. The occupant of this chair has come to see the plain reality that Jesus, listen to me, Jesus is life. He is not a part of life. Jesus is life. As long as you think that Jesus Jesus is a garnish, that he's something there to make your life a little sweeter or to give your life a little bit of extra purpose or extra meaning, You'll never be a growing believer. The people in chair number five are like Philip. They're like Peter. They're like my wife, Ashley. They've come face to face with a person. A man. Who was willing to trade the riches of heaven. To save them from their sins. And that reality changes everything about life. That's what marks a growing believer. What's the invitation? 
that we give to somebody sitting in chair number five. We want these people to fish for men. Whenever Jesus called someone to follow him, this was his new mission statement for their life. See for yourself. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. At once they left their nets and followed him. New mission, new purpose, new authority, new allegiance. They left their nets. These were fishermen. This was their livelihood. Everything changed. That's the occupant of chair number five. That's Philip. Once he encountered Jesus, Jesus became life. Suddenly everything changes. This is a growing believer. This is what I saw in my wife some 20 years ago. When she encountered Jesus, she was so amazed by him, so captivated by him, and by God's grace that would save her, that nothing could ever compete with that. Not making sandwiches, not her own private time, she'd willingly stay after work. She has given up her life because she found something better. She now commits her life to serving. Everywhere she goes, in our marriage, people she doesn't know, she serves all day, every day, with an ear-to-ear Cheshire cat grin. Because what she has found is a master who has paved a way for her that is so appealing that she'd gladly follow him down the Calvary Road rather than living a life where she hoards things for herself because she's amazed by him and his grace. Do you know him? Do you know a Savior like that? Are you in chair number five? Be honest. Now's the time to be honest. He's coming again. Now's the time to get real. Are you really a growing believer? Or is Jesus just a garnish on your life? How should the church respond to people like Philip or people like Ashley? What should we do with somebody like that? That's the next consideration I have for you this morning. We equip people like this. The church equips people in chair number five to make disciples. We give them the money. We give them the resources. We give them the training that they need in order to do what Philip did to Nathaniel. To go out, introduce people to Jesus, and bring them. These are people that are on fire for the Lord, and we want to give them everything that they need to make disciples. Church, that's what the church exists for. The church exists to make disciples. That is our purpose. That is our mission. That's the cause for which we exist. If a church isn't doing that, what are they doing? Our church, Island Baptist Church, our mission statement is simple. We exist to make disciples because that's what Jesus said we exist for. And so we want to equip people in chair number five to do just that. What's our final exhortation for someone in this stage of spiritual development? Fight complacency. Many in this chair refuse to move because they think they've reached their leadership limit. I've met many, many people who are great Sunday school teachers or small group leaders. They're great at teaching the Bible. But when you go and you ask them, hey, listen, why don't you bring it to the next level and train other people to do what you do? You're so good at teaching. You're so good at leading the choir. You're so good at leading worship. You're so good at uh, helping people to um, gather food for the homeless. Why don't you now train other people to do what you do? And unfortunately, I hear this way too often. Nah, I don't think that's for me. I'm I'm just comfortable doing what I do. That's for somebody else. I can't teach anybody to do what I do. And this is where... The process stops. Many people in chair number five refuse to move into the mature leader phase because they're complacent. They are comfortable doing what they feel 
is their comfort zone, the gifts that God has given them. And they won't allow God to stretch them into something new. Complacency kills churches. And so the urgent call to the occupant of chair number five right now is, trust God to do more with your life. Don't be content just leading a Bible study. Train other people to lead Bible studies. One day you're going to be gone. Help people to know how to do what you do so well. That's how the church grows. That's how a church thrives. Are you willing to move into the next phase of spiritual development? Are you comfortable where you're at? God aims to grow you all the days of your life. Are you interested? Before we move on to chair number six, I have to ask many of the older folks who've been in church for decades, if you're going to call yourself a mature Christian, a mature leader, by God's definition of what maturity is, are you willing to move into this seat and to actually train people to do what you've been doing for so many years? To train people to follow Jesus and make disciples. If you're not making disciples, you're not in chair number five. If you're not training other people to make disciples, you can't sit in chair number six. Chair number six, the mature leader. That's the label. We need a definition. The occupant of this chair has grown to a position or a stage of a spiritual grandparent. Here's what I mean by that. This is a person who is producing. Think about a grandparent. They are producing parents who themselves are producing spiritual children. Okay? So it's a disciple of Jesus, a follower of Jesus, who is making other followers of Jesus, who are also making other followers of Jesus. A spiritual grandparent. Now please, for the remainder of this sermon, I'm asking you to divorce in your mind the relationship between the term grandparent and age. Someone who's older. When I say a spiritual grandparent, I could very well mean someone in their 20s or even a teenager. I have known men and women who are so spiritually mature in seat number six because they themselves have led people to Jesus and trained those people to go out and lead other people to Jesus who are leading other people to Jesus. That is a spiritual grandparent and they're only 20 years old. I've also known people in their 70s and 80s who've never done anything like that. They've been a consumer in church almost all their lives. They don't even lead their own children to a deeper knowledge of Jesus. And so when I say spiritual grandparent, I'm specifically talking about someone who is a disciple that is making other disciples who are making disciples. That's why the perfect example of this in the New Testament is the, the man Timothy who was a spiritual grandparent in his 30s. Timothy is a clear example of a Christian who sits in chair number six. Timothy was charged by Paul to go to his church and make disciples, train leaders who will then go out and make it their job to make other disciples and train them up, them up to be leaders. See for yourself. Paul writes to Timothy, and what you have heard from me so Paul discipled Timothy in the presence of many witnesses in trust to faithful men. So pass it along. Make other disciples who will be able to teach others also. You see how it works? A person sit sitting in chair number six is a spiritual grandparent. Someone who has made a spiritual child. They brought someone to Jesus and that child has been born again. They train them up from infancy stage to become a growing believer. And then from a growing believer, that child went out and made another disciple and trained them to become a spiritually mature person. And so the process continues. Spiritual maturity is marked by multiplication. How important is that? So important that I put it on your screen. You need to write this down. Spiritual maturity is marked by multiplication. 
And why is spiritual maturity marked by multiplication? Good question. So glad you asked. Why multiplication? So someone at home probably is saying, you're telling me that I can't be appraised as a spiritually mature person sitting in chair number six unless I'm making disciples? Yes. Yes, that's what I'm telling you. Let me tell you why. In order for someone to commit their lives to investing in another person to make them a disciple, that person has to have seen reality so clearly, to have seen Jesus as so valuable, that they have given up the pursuit of anything else that is a lesser cause to commit their lives to. They have seen heaven's riches as so much more valuable that they don't invest as much in this life anymore and they're investing their lives in heaven. They have believed what Jesus has said. They have seen with spiritual eyes that have been opened. They have become so spiritually mature that they don't waste their time with things that are turning to dust any longer. With investing in the kingdom of self And they instead invest their time into the kingdom of heaven. They have believed what Jesus said when he said, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. Making disciples is how you invest in heaven's treasure and it takes a spiritually mature person to see the futility of investing in any other life's pursuit. That's what I'm trying to say. What's the invitation that Jesus gives to a person seated in chair number six? A spiritually mature person. The invitation Jesus gives, feed my sheep. Jesus said to Peter, who was being groomed to sit in chair number six, feed my sheep. And then a little later, I am sending you. Now, please don't misunderstand. This is not just a call to pastors, as so many people have assumed wrongly. This is a call to moms and dads. Are you willing to train up the next generation of warriors for Christ, filling them with His Word, teaching them and training them. Will you feed His sheep? What's the church's response to someone who we know is mature, training themselves, feeding on His Word and training other people? How should the church respond when we know this person, this man or woman is mature? What should we do? Oh, it's very clear. We should send them. This has been the response of the church all down through the ages. We send people. We equip these people. We train them in the word. We ordain them and we send them out to make new disciples who will make disciples that make disciples, creating more spiritual children of the kingdom of God all over the earth. That's what we're here to do. Now, please take a special note that a spiritual grandparent, someone in seated in chair number six, is not necessarily the person with the most Bible knowledge. Knowledge does not equal spiritual maturity. It's what you do with knowledge. There are people all over the world who have heads filled with knowledge, but they don't use it for what God intended it for. So if you would say, I know a great deal about the Bible, but you're not doing anything with what you know, then you can't sit in chair number six. Wisdom that comes from the Lord is knowing what to do with knowledge. So I don't care if you have chapter and verse memorized. If you're not making disciples, then you've missed the point of everything you've memorized. Who cares how much Scripture you can quote. If you're not making disciples, what are you doing? You've missed the point of the whole Bible. God is here to redeem lost people. 
And he's opened your eyes to send you on that mission. And if you're not out doing it, what are you doing with that knowledge? People who are in chair six, they may not have the most Bible knowledge. We aim to help them learn it. But people who are in chair number six, they know what to do with the limited, perhaps limited knowledge they've been given. And we send those people out to make disciples. And the Spirit will guide them. I remember my mentor, Marty Berglund, saying to me once when I told him that I was spiritually mature, Marty said, where are your protégés? It was an eye-opening moment for him. Luke, if you're spiritually mature and you're ready to lead, where are the people that are following you as you follow Christ? I understood in that moment that to sit in chair number six means I'm making disciples who are making disciples and there is no other way about it. The spiritually mature do what no other seat of the six can do because they trust God to use them to make other spiritual leaders. Now listen, some people might think, oh, these are the most gifted or the brightest or the people with the most degrees hanging on their wall. Actually, Many times it's just the opposite. Many times these are the people who admit that they don't have the resources necessary but are willing to allow God to use them to do whatever is necessary to make disciples. These are usually the people who are on their knees day in and day out who know that they don't have what it takes and they say, here I am, Lord, send me. If you can use me, Lord, then use me. I gave you a biblical example In Timothy, now I'd like to give you a personal example of the person that I have known more than any other person in my entire life who exemplified a mature leader. It's my grandfather, Virgil Guerin. I've shown you pictures of him before but and told you a little bit about him. Would you indulge me as I show them to you again and tell you a little bit more about why he's in chair number six? This is my grandfather, Virgil Guerin. My grandfather was born in 1900, and he died in 1995. I was 17 years old, and he is to this day still the greatest single influence in my life. Let me tell you just a little bit about his story. His dad died before he was born of a disease, and his mom died when he was about two years old. At that point, he went off to live with his grandmother and several uncles, who treated him very poorly. They would do what most would consider today to be abusive things. They forced him to drink beer from his high chair. And they were very cruel men, filthy men. And so, when my grandfather could take it no more, at the age of 12 years old, he ran away from home. He survived by working odd jobs, One was in a paper factory. Another was a meat factory. He was even a boxer and went by the name Kid Garen. I'm especially proud of that one. (laughs) But one day, he met someone who invited him to church. And he heard the gospel. And in that moment, my grandfather saw what he had been looking for his entire life. He saw a heavenly father who loved him. Something he'd never known. And he saw a community, a family that would love him just as he is. The church. In that moment, my grandfather's life was changed forever. And he was captivated by Jesus. At 18 years old, this happened. For the next roughly 70 years, my grandfather committed his life to pursuing and following Jesus. He never made it past the eighth grade and had a very rough education. Never went to high school. And here are some of the things that my grandfather did. He founded Burlington County Christian School. As far as I know, the first Christian school in the state. He founded Central Jersey Bible Institute, the first Bible Training Institute in the state. He hosted a weekly 
radio program every single morning. A Christian radio program. He founded Shady Rest Bible Church. When he died, Governor Christy Whitman called the house because he had made such an influence or an impact and was such an influence on so many people around our state. As a matter of fact, the only other Bible-believing church on Long Beach Island, Pastor Dan Stott is the pastor there, and he himself was a graduate of my grandfather's school. And here's a man who never even went to high school. How did he do this? How did this happen? He believed. He was so caught up by the power of God over his life that he believed that if God could save him, surely he could train him and equip him with the tools necessary. Teach him how to learn the Bible for himself and make disciples. My grandfather was eventually awarded an honorary doctorate by a Bible college. Here a man who only graduated eighth grade was given a doctorate. Why? Because he trusted God to use him. That's the person seated in chair number six. A man who makes disciples, who makes disciples because he believes that God can use him. A final exhortation for someone that is mature. We exhort these people to live as lifelong learners. Many in this chair stop moving. And you might ask, that's chair six. Where is there left to move? The Apostle Paul was a gift. He was a gift given by God as the example to the world of a man whose pursuit in life was to never stop learning. Church, if you've grown older and you haven't learned anything new in a while, that's when people begin to die. Don't you realize that there are people watching your life to see how to die for the glory of God? People are watching you, no matter how old you are. Someone, someone is influenced by your life. They want to see someone who will not give up pursuing Jesus. Someone who is so captivated by Him. Someone who is still so amazed by His grace that they won't stop growing in their understanding of who He is. What I need right now in my mid-40s I need to see strong men. Strong men who won't quit on their family. Strong men who won't quit on God. Strong men who won't give in when the world is constantly giving an invitation to compromise. That's what I need. I need to see strong men who are willing to die for the gospel. I need to see strong men in their 50s and 60s who won't stop learning and pursuing greatness for the kingdom of God. I need to see men who won't stop cherishing their wives. I need men like Paul in my life. Would you be that kind of a man? And so we, be, we end where we began. With the Apostle Paul who said, not that I've already obtained this, or I'm already perfect. But I press on to make it my own. Because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own. But one thing I do. Forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way. Brothers, join in imitating me. And keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. God desires that you grow until you see Jesus face to face. That's been the point of these three messages. He desires that you mature. And maturing means movement. 
In closing, the Bible that I've been using today is my grandfather's preaching Bible. It's one of many that he had. This is one that he used in the 60s. It's all tattered up and there's all kinds of notes written on the inside. This is a real treasure to me. But on the inside cover, there's a photograph of my grandmother who just turned 102 last week and my grandfather. And on the back of this photograph, there's written, there's written a statement by Teddy Roosevelt that became a staple of my grandfather's life and ministry. You probably know this statement. Teddy Roosevelt once said, nobody cares how much you know until they know how much you care. The spiritually mature among us are not the ones with the most advanced degrees hanging on their walls. They're the ones whose love compels them to carry a cross. May God send us men and women with just such a compulsion. Father in heaven, your church needs to grow. Perhaps that's what's happening here now. In our world, perhaps you are cleaning house. Judgment begins with the house of God. And perhaps you are cleaning house so that your people, your true people, will put away all those things, those silly things that compete for your attention. And we would return to simple church. Simple preaching of the word and singing. Glorious singing that lifts up the name of Jesus. Please don't give up on us. I ask on behalf of all the people of Island Baptist Church that you would not give up on us that you would continue to grow us and mature us, each one of us as individuals and our corporate body of believers, that we would become men and women who would be willing to trade our comforts for the glory of the gospel and to get it out across the street and around the world. Because that's what we're here for. That's what we've been saved for. God help us. God help the church. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.